We need to pray for Dad, obviously, and uh, really Angie, as she puts up with Dad. So I went there on the way here uh, to visit with him, and he was, he was in rare form. He, he was seeing people, and it, it, was, it was a little, it was kind of funny at first. The longer it went, I started getting a little nervous. You're like, what are they giving him here? Uh, and they did some research, and uh, one of the medicines that they had given him earlier in the day that he hadn't had before, and one of the side effects, side effects was like hallucinations or delusions or whatever. So that made me feel a little bit better that he isn't actually going crazier than he already was. But um, yeah, so I, I asked him, I said, are, are they scary? Because, you know, the, anytime anybody sees an angel in the Bible, they, you know, they have to say fear not. So want to make sure when he said no they, what, they weren't talking to him he wasn't talking to them he knew that they weren't there but he could see them so but he's good now <laughs> we'll see hopefully all right so I continue to pray for him um, for sure and then Jonah we just recapping a little bit last week uh, we talked about you know Jonah is not an allegory it's not a story it's it's very um, it's been known and a lot of people kind of use it as that and obviously we come up with stories all the time uh, to convey a message, to teach a lesson and it's good when you're teaching kids and when you're you know, wanting to make something memorable to come up with the story uh, but Jesus acknowledged it, uh, the Bible you know, talks about it so it settles it, it's definitely not an allegory, it's something that really happened and then talked about how Jonah was a great book, full of all types of uh, lessons to learn, full of all types of things that we should be able to apply to our life and that can make us uh, better Christians, but also how that it's missing some stuff that, you know, I, I guess I say missing. God put it there for a reason, so it's not really missing, but stuff that I wish that I knew more. Um, and we'll, you know, continue to talk about those things as we, as we go through. Um, we know that Jonah didn't think the Ninevites deserved God's mercy, um, obviously he enjoyed the mercy of God himself, but he didn't think that the Ninevites uh, deserved it. We talked about how Nineveh was a big city. It was an important city. Uh, they had been a thorn in the flesh in the sides of the Israelites for generations. Uh, Jonah obviously knew from the cycle of judges and everything that had happened before that God used these big countries to punish Israel when they were doing wrong. So he probably had a pretty good idea that Assyria was going to be one of those countries and that Nineveh was a big part of that. Uh, so that combined with the po politics that we kind of talked about with Assyria getting smaller at that point, Israel getting a little bit bigger, retaking some of the land that they had lost, uh, and that, you know, politically it was bad for Israel. Uh, we know that the Jews had problems with God you know, caring about Gentiles um, for a long time there. Uh, and so that could have played into it. And just how the fact that the Ninevites and the Assyrians were just overall wicked people. Uh, they were known for, you know, doing uh, horrible things, especially in war. Uh, you know, people, the stories historically of, you know, cities, entire people, groups of people killing themselves rather than being captured by the Assyrians because they didn't want to be skinned and used for wallpaper in the city, in, 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 in the Assyrian cities, which I totally understand. Uh, so all of these play into a factor in why Jonah probably didn't want to go. Um, and, we, and we talked about all of these things last week. Um, we're going to go ahead and read all of chapter 1 to start with, and then we'll go back through where we left off last week. I am bound to determine to get through the whole first chapter tonight. So we'll go ahead and we'll read the whole first chapter of Jonah. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it and go with, to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea and there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God. 
and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation, and whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am in Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up, cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not. For the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hath done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men, men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. All right, so we saw there in verse 1 that Jonah was a prophet. He was called by God to give a message to a specific pe people, and that message was to come true. And that is the, the thing that the qualifications of a prophet, things that need to, to uh, take place. We saw that we see there in the first couple of verses that the Ninevites, the wickedness, had come up before God. And Jonah got the call, and he was told to go just a little bit this way, and instead he went way over here to the westernmost part of the known world, several thousand miles away, to run from God because of his righteous anger towards God. We talked about that quite a bit last week, how that Jonah knew that he was right and God was wrong. Now, we all know that he knew wrong, but he knew in his heart that this wasn't what should be going on. This wasn't the God that he had worshipped his entire life, the God that he had grown up studying about and learning and, and praying to, and, and he knew that this just, why? This, this isn't right. So he thought he, thought he was right so much. As we see in the passage, and we'll talk about it a little bit more, he was willing to die for it. And we see that the mighty tempest came up, the miraculous storm that everybody knew was not normal on board there. And then lastly, we talked about last week, the storms in our lives that come up, and how that this was a storm of correction, trying to get Jonah back on the wrong path, the right path, because he was on the wrong path. And we talked about the other storms um, that we mentioned, storms of perfection of maturity, things that go through in our life, and then storms of direction where God needs us in a place to accomplish his will. And here Jonah is in the storm of correction. And in verse 5, this is one that, that, that I really picked up on in my most recent studies as well, is that all of these guys on this ship around Jonah were going through this horrible upheaval in their life because of the sin of the prophet of God. Because Jonah was running from God, all of these guys who we know are pagan and they have their own issues in life, I'm sure like we all do, but they were caught up in the middle of the consequences of Jonah's sin and Jonah's running from God. Now, I don't want anybody blaming your spouse or brother, sister, mom, dad, whatever, for the sins in their life causing you storms. But these guys, they, they really, <laughs> these guys, they really didn't deserve what was going on right there. And they were caught into something that Jonah had caused. 
Now, we, we see that God worked this all together for good, and he came out to be glorified in this. And we pray that in, you know, in all situations uh, that, that, can, that that can happen, and we know that God works all things together for good to them that love the Lord. But Jonah had messed their entire, days, their, their entire life up. They had lost the money that they had taken on. Because, you know, the ship's tossing. It's a mess. They think the ship's going to break. The only thing that's going to save the ship is to get rid of all this heavy stuff, right? They had all these Amazon packages that they had to take to Tarshish. They, you know, they had all this, the, the wares, they had their food. You know, whatever they took on that ship for this really long journey, it's all gone, right? They just, they thrown it overboard. So, you know, not only is their ship getting ready to fall apart, they don't have any food, All the supplies that they had paid for, for it's all gone. And all of this, because Jonah was told to go, and he said no. And Jonah, by evidence, doesn't really care a whole lot about what all this stuff going on, because he knows he's right. He thinks he knows he's right, right? And, and And I just see and I think about this in our, in our own lives. And how that small decisions in our lives can make big consequences in other people's lives. We've seen churches split. We've seen families destroyed. We've all seen it. We all probably have three things that just came to our mind. That consequences that innocent people had to go through because of our selfishness. Even if we think we were right. Now last week I I kind of threw in the Jacob and Esau and I used it in running running away from God. I totally missed that part in my notes. It was the, (laughs) it was more towards the justification of things. Esau justifying the fact that he was getting rid of his birthright because he was going to die anyway, right? But, so I kind of messed that up last week. I missed that little line or whatever. But we have that in our lives, right? That justification thing, that thing where we can go, well, this is okay because of. And Jonah thought he was justified in what he was doing because he thought, you know, God's obviously messed up here. I'm going to help him out. I'm going to make sure that these Ninevites get what they deserve. Israel's going to be good. And we have that in our lives a lot too. It's easy to justify when we are doing something we are righteously angry about, right? We, we know we're right. We think we're right. We think we know better than God. We think we know better than what the Bible tells us to do. We think we know. So we justify these things, and it causes these enormous upheaval, not only in our own life, but people around our lives. And obviously, we need to be careful of these things when we're going through temptation in our life. You know, a lot of times, people don't care about themselves as much as they do their loved ones, their parents, their kids. So when you're tempted next time, instead of just thinking about yourself, think about all of the collateral damage that you could cause in your life and how that it's not worth it. I mean, it, it's not. So we, that, that was something that really stood out to me in that section. And that was something that I hadn't really, one of the things of Jonah that I had missed for years there, but an important point there. Like I said, these men had thrown everything overboard. They'd done everything they thought they could do. So they thought, all right, we're on our last ditch effort. Let's pray to our little G-gods, right? And, and that was to no avail, obviously. And so they're looking around. They're going, hey, wh- where's the guy that just got on the ship at the last minute here? Where, where's he? Oh, he's went down into the bottom of the ship. Which, once again, a tendency that we have as Christians, right? We, we mess up, we run from God, and then we try to, you know, go to sleep or <laughs> hide away somewhere down away from everything. We might try to stay busy uh, in our daily life, you know, whether we sink ourselves into work more or, uh, you know, we never take our headphones out of our ears, which I'm bad about sometimes. But, you know, you, you got to keep that mind busy, You don't want to be still, because if you're still, then you, you you know, God, that's when God really starts working on you, right? When you're asleep, you're gone, right? (laughs) You're out of it, you don't know what's going on. But when, when you just sit down 
and don't do things, or you're still, that's when God really starts working on you there. And Jonah here had a clear conscience, evidently. He was down in there. He was sleeping. Now, I could probably sleep through a storm like that, too. But we need to make sure that we aren't sleeping when we should be seeking God. And Jonah here should have been seeking God, but he wasn't. He was down in the bottom of the ship. He was sleeping. He was doing whatever he could to distract. Um, and, you know, feelings, we have to be careful about our feelings, right? As human beings, obviously, uh, our, our feelings mislead us a lot. You know, I, there was this old stand-up, Christian stand-up guy, Mark Lowry, uh, that <laughs> way back, I think, I think I went with Bob and Sue to the concert where we got the CD, and you know, and he's like, feelings, you know, mess up with you. He said, you know, he's got this alarm clock that went off. It was this big honking alarm clock that made a lot of noise. And at four o'clock in the morning, when that alarm clock goes off, he doesn't feel saved, you know, and he was very dramatic about it. And we have to be careful about our feelings, because Jonah felt like he was doing what he should do. It was totally against God. But once again, he was using the wrong ruler, right? He wasn't using, like, the measuring stick ruler. <laughs> he wasn't using the ruler as his guide. He was thinking on his own terms. He was thinking in his own, in his own mind there. Verse 6. So the shipmaster came to him and said, What, what meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if, it be, if, it so, if so be that God will think upon us, that we perish not. So here we have a pagan guy coming down to the prophet of God and saying, hey, pray. <laughs> it's kind of funny, right? I mean, we, we got the guy that doesn't believe in God, that doesn't know anything about God, telling the prophet of God to pray. Now, what's the biggest problem with this? Jonah wasn't really in the right mindset of prayer, right? He had erected this huge wall between him and God that he didn't plan on tearing down anytime soon. He didn't want to talk to God. And you see that he makes no effort here to talk to God. The guy wakes him up, says, hey, pray, shouldn't you be praying? That maybe God, and here in the verse, it uses the big G God. So he, he, he's saying, Jonah, call upon your God and, and see if, if we can do it. But, but Jonah, he was stubborn. He was stiff neck. He was so willing to die at this point that he, it didn't bother him. He, didn't, he, he wasn't going to tear down that wall. And once again, just really just stick it right in you, right? But that knife sticking in that conviction. How many times do we have this come up in our life where we know that this is the right opportunity to pray? Or somebody might say, hey, can you pray for? And you, you oh yeah, you're a good Christian. Yeah, I'll pray for but then you walk away and you go, yeah, I'm not really in a good position. To, well, I'll fix that later. I'll pray later and ask for forgiveness. And, and that's why the Bible says, pray without ceasing, right? Not literally walking around with your eyes closed, head bowed, right? And where, you know, I do it in children's church and I walk into a wall, you know. It's having that constant attitude of prayer where if someone or someone comes upon your heart or someone asks you to pray for them, that you don't, that you, you have that attitude of prayer, you have that relationship where you can go to the Lord and you can ha have that, that conversation. Jonah wasn't in that situation here. He, he wasn't, and not only was he not in the situation, he didn't want to be in the situation. He was being stubborn. He knew God was wrong. And we obviously, as Christians uh, and, and people that want to do right, we need to be careful about that. We need to be careful about our anger and uh, our relationship with the Lord and, and staying in a position where at any point, because we've all been in situations where we get that phone call, we look down and we go, well, it's 11 o'clock at night. That can't be good. You know, having that relationship, continuing that relationship with the Lord where at any point we can feel good about talking to our Heavenly Father and not being in a position, putting ourselves in a position where um, we can't do that. Verse number 7, And they said, Everyone to his fellow, come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Now, casting lots was a very, very common thing back then. 
uh, you know, we would think of it as, you know, drawing straws and the, you know, person that gets the short straw is the one that messed things up um, or the one that has to do whatever it is everybody else doesn't want to do. So it was a common thing. It was practiced, um, you know, and God made sure that this lot fell on Jonah. He wanted everyone there to know <laughs> this guy is the reason this storm is going on. Verse 8. Then said they unto him, tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? First question, what is thine occupation? Second question, whence comest thou? Third question, what is thy country? Fourth question, and of what people art thou? So now they know the who, right? They know who it is, because that guy got the lot. And now they want to know the why. And so the interrogation, interrogation begins. We don't see Jonah talking at this point still. He's still just sitting there, a lot casting his way, still mum the word, he's, he's not volunteering anything yet, so they have to ask him, alright, you, <laughs> and they ask these four questions. Now, this is part of it that maybe I'm reading into a little bit more than I should be, I don't know, but I find it interesting that in Jonah's response, he doesn't answer all four of the questions, he only answers three of the questions. Look at his response in verse number 9. And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew. So he tells them where he, where he comes from. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. So he told them where he comes from. He told them what his country. And he tells them where his, who his people are. not But they said, what is your occupation? He didn't mention his occupation. He didn't mention, well, I'm a prophet of God. Now, once again, I might be reading into it a little bit, I don't know. But I find it interesting that that's the question he didn't answer. Does he think that he's disqualified himself? Is he quitting? <laughs> is this his way of telling God, yep, here's my resignation? Or is he ashamed of it at this point because he knows, you know, things are expected? I mean, these guys probably knew what prophets were, right? I mean, they were in Israel, so they probably had a basic understanding of prophets. They might have even known Jonah's name. Maybe they knew that Jonah was the guy that prophesied that they were going to get back some of the northern kingdom. Not really exactly sure why he didn't mention it, but I find it a little bit interesting that he didn't give that piece of the information. Um... But they move on from the questioning, right? Then, let's see, verse number 10 there. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So Jonah does tell them, Well, I did flee from the Lord. But he still doesn't, you know, keep on with that conversation. Many points in this interaction and in this first chapter, Jonah could make things right, right? And we have the same things in our life. We have opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, even when we're going down the wrong path, even when we're making the wrong decisions. We have lots of chances, and we, we just keep ignoring those chances. At any point, Jonah could have said, you know what, fellas, just turn the boat around. And I think God probably would have stopped the storm. Everything would turn around. They could have went back to... Tarshish, and he could have headed on to Nineveh, and I think all would have been. But he's just so angry. He just, his heart is just hard towards this. He doesn't want to do it because he doesn't think he should have to. Because God has messed up. And Jonah has just tied himself into a knot here. Verse number 11. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. So they're like, all right, so what should we do to you, Jonah? Since you have run from God, you've made these bad decisions, how do we fix it, right? And this is what we all want to know when we get into these storms of life. Uh, and, and this is when it's the easiest to pray, right? When the, when the storms are, well, it should be. Jonah still had difficulty with it. But these men didn't have difficulty with it. They wanted to pray. They wanted to figure out what was going on. Jonah already knew what he had to do. And so, like, so now, what do we do? How do we fix it? Once again, Jonah could have prayed. He could have said, turn the boat around. He could have even went and jumped into the water. He could have just cannonballed over to the side. And, you know, the, the, lots of options. Still nothing. He was still too angry. Verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, 
but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. So they knew what was going on now. They knew what they needed to do, but they kept rowing. And once again, in our lives, we keep rowing, right? Keep doing whatever we can do on our own power, on our own accord. We've already thrown everything overboard. Everything's already lost. Let's just keep on doing what we should do, what we think we should do. I'm sure these men, these men had good hearts in this, right? They were trying to avoid killing a guy. <laughs> that was a big thing even to them as pagans. But they, you know, Jonah still, once again, like Brother Mark said last week, horrible testimony, <laughs> the worst kind of testimony a Christian could ever have to, with these pagans. He, he's not doing anything right, but they're, they're still trying to row. And we try to do our own human efforts all the time. We get ourselves in a hole, and we think that if we keep digging, we're going to get out of that hole, even though all we're doing is getting deeper down in the hole. And so once again, Jonah had an opportunity here. He could have made things better, but he still didn't. Verse 14, Wherefore they cried to the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So finally they've reached all other, all other uh, explanations, all other remedies are out the window. They finally realize and so they pray. And they pray to the true God here. Don't, don't hold this against us. <laughs> We're just guys doing what he's telling us to do. Don't, don't hold this against us. Uh, and it's interesting here that once again that, that the pagans... Uh, are the ones that are praying. And they don't want to be put to death because Jonah made a bad decision. Verse 15, So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. So here we see the second big miracle. They're, they pick him up, throw him over the board, and he barely he hits the water, boom. Everything's calm again. And we see another example there for our lives. When we do what God wants us to do, now these men, you know, and for them, everything's turning out okay right now. For Jonah, things have just started to get bad. Um, but, but they do what, they're, what, what God wants them to do, and the sea stops. And this is amazing to them, right? I mean, it would be a, this is a huge storm. These guys had been through many storms. They were sailors. That's what they did. And the Mediterranean Sea was known for its storms. I mean, throughout the Bible, just, you know, there's lots of storms mentioned, mentioned just in the Bible. So this wasn't new to them. This was a big, you know, storm. And it was bigger than the storms. They knew it was abnormal. They knew that it was from God. And so this really caused them to see uh, the true power of God. They realized the power of the true God. And they offered sacrifices. Well, am I getting ahead of me? Yeah, let's read verse 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. So they knew all of this was bad. They see finally the power of God in true form, in his grace, and his mercy. Still Jonah, he, he don't, he still's not seeing it. It's going to still take him a few days there, right? He's going to still take him three more days and three more nights before he starts uh, coming to the light. But despite the horrible testimony of jo Jonah, God showed his power. And thankfully, <laughs> God can still do that with us. Because we all make mistakes, right? We all make bad decisions. We all do things that as soon as we're done, we hit ourselves in the head and go, you know, what was I thinking? We've all had bad testimonies. You know, I'm sure that we could go to any number of places in, in, around our lives and talk to people uh, that we used to work with. And we can find people that didn't like us and that could find fault in what we did. So we all make mistakes. We're human. Um, but thankfully, God can still show his power. So, all's not lost, even though Jonah's a knucklehead. Uh, these men turn to God. They realize that God is in charge of all this, that he is powerful. And we see a great uh, change in these men's life here. It, but how much better would it have been had Jonah just hopped on board with God earlier? How much better would it have been for Jonah to witness to these men and on his way back to Tarshish to do what he should have done. And we as Christians, the earlier we can get in on what God's doing, 
the better off we're going to be. We can fight it. We can run. We can bury our heads in the sand. We can go to sleep in the bottom of the ship. But if God wants us, he's going to keep pulling. And we can't run from him. We can't run faster than God. He knows where we're at and he knows what's going on. Um, verse number 17 now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So here we see the word prepared. Um, some people think that this was a special fish made just for Jonah. Uh, some people interpret this as not that he prepared a special fish just for Jonah, but he selected a fish and said, okay, you're the fish that's going to do this. Um, I don't, I don't really think it matters a whole lot. Either one direction, I think that, you know, the, any way you look at it, God knew, <laughs> and the fish knew. And that's all that really mattered. The fish knew that at this point, he, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come up and I'm going to swallow Jonah down, and I'm, I'm going to have an upset stomach for a few days. Uh, it's not going to be pleasant, but I know I need to do it. Um... <laughs> Anyway, uh, he had chosen this fish. He had set it aside for this exact moment in Jonah's life. He knew what was going to happen. He knew what Jonah needed to get him back on the right track. And he knows what we need. He knows what our family needs. Uh, we, we might be, you know, drowning in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, but yet God knows where we're at and what we need. Just like he knew with Jonah, what Jonah needed. He knew Jonah was a hardhead. He knew that Jonah had a righteous anger at him. He knew, and he just keeps showing his, his grace and his mercy on Jonah's life as well. He keeps showing him, you know, all right, let's try again. <laughs> all right, have you, have you got it yet? All right, uh, won't, uh, will, a, will a giant fish swallow you for three days? Will that get it done? So, same thing in our lives. God knows what we need. When we're going through storms, he knows how hard we need to be smacked in the back of the head to be woken up to. Let's flip over to Psalm. Verse 139. Psalm 139. We'll read verses 13 through 17. For thou hast possessed my reins... Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, and curiously wrought in the lowest part of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect and in thy book, all my members were written, which as continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious are also are thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of them. No matter where we go, even before we were born, when we were in our mother's womb, God knew us. God knew what we needed. And he, had a pl he, has, he has a plan for us. He had a plan for us. He has a plan for us. And even in our most knucklehead moments, he's, he's got plan B. Not to steal the sermon series there. But he's got the plan B for us Sunday mornings. Rest of the month. <laughs> um, now, as far as being in the fish, you know, I, I looked up. I'm sure we've all done it at some point. I googled, you know, living in a fish or three days in a whale or, you know, and, and it, Google comes up with all types of stuff. And there were several stories that I saw. The one that was most prominent was from 1891. Uh, and it was this whaling ship, and they were looking for, you know, they were, they were whaling, they were trying to catch whales. Uh, during this battle with this mighty whale, a guy fell overboard, they thought he had drowned, they thought he had died. A couple days later, like a day and a half later, they were cutting the fish open, they were gutting him, you know, piecing him out as they do, and they found the guy. He was in there, he was alive. He was out of it. He had lost all his hair, he was bleached from the gastric juices, I guess. And he said that while he was in there, he didn't have any trouble breathing, but it was really, really hot. And supposedly he had been in there for like 36 hours. Now, I have no idea if this is true. This is 1891. 
record keeping back then wasn't great. It was the story that he liked to tell. There's, been, there's a lot of people that say it didn't happen. I don't know. Could God prepare a fish for Jonah to live in for three days? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you know, he made it all. So what, what would be one more fish? Uh, but this is an interesting, you know, thought. Um, the, you know, we, we, it has happened. He wasn't digested. You know, I don't know if it's true or not. Uh, some people believe that Jonah died in the whale. That can be a debate for a different day. Uh, they say to be a true type of Christ, which we see in Matthew, and we'll flip over there um, before, we, before we close to the, when Jesus is talking about this. Some people believe that Jonah died inside the whale. Giant fish, great fish, whatever you want to call it. I don't necessarily believe that's true. It doesn't say that he died while he was in the whale, but next week we'll talk about his prayer and some of the things that he says there uh, where, they, where, where people get that impression. Um, I don't necessarily think he did, but any way you look at it, he was in the whale, giant fish, for three days and three nights. Some other people also believe that it wasn't a true three-day and three-night period. Now, what I've studied... And what I've seen is, is that there are instances in the Hebrew where they say three days, and it can be the part of any three days. So really, you have a 24-hour period, and then any part of time on either side of that 24-hour period for three days. I don't believe that's true. The Bible says three days and three nights. Uh, I believe he was in there for three days and three nights. Literally, three whole days and three whole nights. Brother Bob just did a little study on that. I got it, and I was reading through that. I mean, it, it, makes, it makes sense, and, and, it, and it goes in line. Um, and, it, and it matters. You know, so in some situations, you know, it doesn't always matter, some of the things. Either way you look at it, Jonah was in there for three days and three nights, just like Jesus was dead for three days and three nights and rose again. Let's go over, and we'll, we'll close with this. Uh, in Matthew 12, 38 through 41, we'll read this again. Matthew 12, 38 through 41. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. So these men, the scribes of the Pharisees, they wanted a sign from Jesus, and he says... You're not going to get a sign, you know. Well, you will get a sign. You're going to get the same sign that Jonah had when he was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights. I'm going to be dead in, for three days and three nights. And that's, that's the sign. That's really going to show you. Now, obviously, we know from the rest of that, from the rest of the Gospels, didn't really show them. They, they, they didn't listen. They didn't heed it. But we have that same sign to tell other people about. And we have that same thing that, you know, of all the little G gods out there in society today uh, that, that, you know, claim power, they all died, right? None of them came back. Whereas Jesus, for three days and three nights, was in, in the grave, but he came back. So just in closing, uh, you know, missed opportunities, like, like Brother Mark talked about last week, uh, the, the thing that really got, gets him most about this story is the bad testimony and missed opportunities that Jonah had here in this first, first chapter of doing what God wanted him to do. God kept giving him second chances, third chances, but we want to try to avoid <laughs> those second and third chances. We want to do things right the first time. We don't want to miss those opportunities. When, you know, the Lord lays somebody on our heart to talk to them, to witness to them, to tell them about, uh, about Jesus, to invite them to church, you know, to do all of these things. We all have these, you know, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, pushing us in certain directions, tell us things to do. Do it the first time, because it's always going to be the easiest. I know it's not always, uh, I know it's not always, I know it's not, it's simple, but it's not easy. Um, 
you know, the curse of knowledge gets us all sometimes too. You know, I, I think of that a lot with the discipleship process. And that's something that, you know, I, as a church and me specifically, uh, we need to, you know, get better on is, is discipling younger Christians and, and helping them. And for a lot of us, we've grown up in church. We've grown up in, in you know, in, in it's we have that curse of knowledge where we think because we know it and it's so second nature to us that everybody knows it. And it's not always, not usually the case. So going out of our way and, and doing these things that we're not missing opportunities that the Lord's giving to us. All right, I'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. Thank you for uh, the lessons that we see here in Jonah and the things that you would have for us, Lord. Just pray that we would be uh, open, receptive to your leading, to your calls, Lord, that we would not have missed opportunities, that we would not uh, have bad testimonies out in, out in the world, Lord, that we would always be in a position where we can come to you and we can seek your face and we can um, pray to you, Lord. Just pray that you be with us, keep us safe as we go out tonight and bring us back at the appointed time, Lord, and ask all these things in your name. Amen.